Good afternoon, Alameda County RCFEs. Thank you for joining us today on Tuesday, February 16th. We appreciate you working with us to modify the date. We didn't want a date to go by or a week to go by without checking in and providing you some much needed updates. As a reminder, we are always recording. And of course, we're gonna send you both the slide deck and the recording after today's session. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Farrell, who's been our fearless leader throughout this pandemic. He has some important information to share. So David, take it away. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. And um, thank you for joining this Tuesday afternoon. We usually meet on Mondays, but um, we had our holiday. We didn't want to skip a day because, of course, there's just so much going on and there's been a flurry of, of pins that have come out and many of these are affecting you. We want to make sure that we gave you an update on the vaccine and our interpretation of the pins um, that are affecting long-term care facilities in Alameda County. So in the middle of last week, we were able to compile this very positive vaccination data most of it coming from the facilities that are in the CDC Federal Pharmacy Partnership Program. As most of you know, CVS and a little bit of Walgreens are serving over 600 of our long-term care facilities. And by the middle of last week, they had administered over 30,000 doses. Um, most of our long-term care facilities have already had their first clinic. Only a few facilities have clinics scheduled this week, their first clinic scheduled this week. Uh, the majority of our long-term care facilities will have their second clinic finished by March 15th. Now that's significant because it means that if we have a very high number of residents who accepted the vaccine and get their second dose on uh, before the 15th of March, by the end of March, um, most of our long-term care facility residents will be fully vaccinated with both doses, thus protecting them from getting severe disease caused by COVID-19 and, and preventing them from ending up in the hospital or in the ICU. So I hope that most of you have already had your first clinic. If you hadn't yet and you're very worried or or for some reason you're having delays with your clinic, uh, please be in touch with us. Put it in the chat box. Um, we're happy to work with you, but this is very positive data. Um, and we're also feeling like, we don't have data to prove it, but we're certainly feeling like you're doing a good job and working with your staff and, and convincing them to take the vaccine. We're also studying the possible impact of the vaccine. And because skilled nursing facilities were the first to go in Alameda County, we're studying the 26 skilled, nurse, skilled nursing facilities in our county who've already completed their second dose and had a very high number of residents and staff who accepted both doses. And they're 14 days out, meaning that they're fully inoculated. And what we're seeing here within these facilities is, is, is that their number of cases is, is plummeting. Now, granted, community cases and positivity rates are also going down, but for this very small segment of our 74 skilled nursing facilities, uh, very positive data related to the possible impact of the vaccine on, on their residents and staff. So let's talk a little bit about more about what you can do to increase your vaccination rates. Because for most of you, you haven't had your second clinic and you haven't had your third clinic. And it's really important that you, that you act on this time, this precious time that you have between the clinics to increase the number of staff and your residents accepting the vaccine so that you can protect people from getting severe disease and begin to open up your, your facility to visitation and getting back to normal. It's gonna be very difficult to get back to normal if you don't have a high participation rate with the COVID vaccine. 
So last week, the CDC put out a research study uh, that highlighted the main reasons why uh, individuals are, are not interested in getting the vaccine. And of course, most of this applies to healthcare workers and the, and the individuals that you employ. So as you can see, this is in descending order related to the percentage of individuals that cited that concern as a reason why they have not accepted the vaccine. And together, let's kind of look at each one of these and determine whether or not that reason, potentially a reason that your staff member is stating, let's determine whether or not that reason identified by the CDC is actually vaccine hesitancy that you can overcome or someone who's saying, no way, Jose, there's just no way that I'm ever taking the vaccine, which is someone you probably don't really want to spend a lot of time on when you're trying to increase your vaccine participation rates. So the first one, concern about side effects and safety of the vaccine, 23%, almost a quarter of all people who have concerns about the vaccine talk about the side effects. So clearly this would be under the bucket of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, these are folks that just wanna see that others didn't have very big side effects and then they're very likely to accept the vaccine. So you overcome that hesitancy by having people who accepted the vaccine talk about what side effects that they experienced so that they can convince their colleagues that it was no big deal. The second most common reason people don't accept the vaccine is that their concerns were that the vaccine was rushed, that it was developed too quickly. 21.6% people say that. Well, once again, that would fall into the bucket of vaccine hesitancy. It just requires that some individuals who the staff know and trust uh, discuss how the vaccine was developed and the fact that it was developed quickly, but no steps were skipped. The third most common reason of why people don't accept the vaccine was simply that they plan to wait and see if it's safe or may, they might get it later. So clearly, once again, the 18% who fall into this category, we'd put that into vaccine hesitancy. They're just kind of waiting and seeing. So maybe they're kind of the last to go, but they're still gonna get it. Maybe they could even get their first dose at your third clinic and then get the second dose at one of our vaccine pods here in Alameda County. The fourth one you see there, almost 10%, well, they just don't trust the government. Maybe for these folks, we're gonna put them in the bucket of no way. You know, Maybe you don't wanna spend too much time trying to convince them to trust the government. <laughs> or, um, or, or the ones that say, the 3.4% who say, well, I'm gonna use my masks and precautions anyway. Um, again, vaccine hesitancy, these folks require some education um, around the necessity to get the vaccine, not only to protect themselves for en from ending up in the ICU, and, and potentially crippling their family financially, but also simply to make sure that they potentially aren't spreading the virus to others. Here are the best practices for you to increase the number of staff who will accept the vaccine. Communicate with them frequently. Download the materials from CVS and Walgreens that answer people's questions. Meet one-on-one -on -one with individuals who didn't accept the vaccine the first time, but might the second time. Make sure that they know all the leaders if took the vaccine and tell people about the side effects that you felt. Uh, give education, have town hall meetings, share resources have medical directors or nurse practitioners come in and engage in a community meeting with the staff, a Q&A session with people that they respect. Invite one of us from the Alameda County Public Health Department to come over and talk to your staff. We'd be happy to do that. And, and offer an incentive, hold drawings and raffles for staff who receive the vaccine or or raffle off a hoodie or something, but you know, make it fun. 
uh, inspire the staff to get vaccinated. It's really, really important. And there's lots of places for your staff to get vaccinated now. Um, as you know, we were sending out invitations week after week, but we really don't have to do that now. Um, there are many locations for your staff to go and get vaccinated uh, when they want to. So if they don't get vaccinated at your clinic or maybe the clinic was on Tuesday and the, they decide on Thursday they wanna get vaccinated, send them to many of these locations. As you know, the huge Coliseum uh, pod just opened today and has the capacity to vaccinate up to 6,000 people. Your staff are eligible to go to any of these, except of course, to the Santa Rita jail. Um, I also want to alert you to the new PIN. So there's been a flurry of new provider information notices that have come out that affect you and your organization. And it's really important that you stay on top of these. The first one I want to highlight was issued on January 26, that's PIN 2106, which provides guidance regarding the discontinued use of decontaminated N95 filtering face mask, face piece respirators. So in other words, uh, it's been determined that there are plenty of N95s available. So you should not be engaging in the reuse of N95s. You should not be engaging in decontaminating your N95s in order to reuse them. On February 5th, PIN 2110 was issued by the California Department of Social Services. And it, it, it reminded folks that if you're using N95s in your facility, whatever facility you're managing, if you're using N95s in order to protect your staff uh, via transmission-based precautions, then you must adhere to the OSHA standards for fit testing and other related requirements, including a plan. So that's what that pin highlights for you. And then also that same day on February 5th, pin 2109 was issued. And this informs uh, RCFEs and others that prevention emergency regulations were issued and they affect you personally, you, they affect your facility. And I'm gonna review the specifics within there um, that you should pay particular attention to. On February 8th, PIN 2111 was issued. And it just reminds you that even though uh, your, your staff and residents are getting vaccinated, that testing has to continue. And whatever the most stringent testing requirement is in your county, which is what Alameda County imposed in February, you'll have to keep following that. And that's, uh, it also in this pin uh, highlights for you a new testing resource, the State Valencia Lab. And then also last week on February 10th, pin 2112 was released. And this is a, a, a 12 page pin that provides updated guidance related to cohorting, staffing considerations, uh, PPE, and required use of face coverings. And, and I'll go over some of the details of that one with you today. So first, uh, PIN 2112 talks about cohorting. And essentially uh, what this PIN does is it, it indicates that, um, that CDSS is in favor of cohorting residents now Whereas in the past, they were more in favor of uh, keeping residents where they were and indicating what status they were, red, yellow, or green, according to uh, COVID. But it seems that in this pin, 
they're leaning more towards the necessity of true cohorting, which means that you're moving residents around and having, of course, specific areas of your uh, facility that would be red, yellow, or green for designated residents who were positive, who were under suspicion, or, uh, or who those were who were negative in the green. So here, it just in the letter, it specifies that your red area would be for those positive residents. Your yellow area would be for people under investigation. These might be for symptomatic residents who you uh, haven't got the test results back for. Uh, those suspected of having COVID-19 due to direct exposure and you're awaiting test results. Might also be a, a new admission in your yellow zone that you're quarantining to make sure. And of course, your yellow zone, it's really important that it has a lot of single rooms and single bathrooms because you never wanna mix up individuals who are in your yellow zone because you never really know who has what. So try and avoid any type of, uh, uh, of people rooming together if you can in your yellow zone. You also have your exposed residents in the yellow zone and the new admissions. And then those green are those residents with no known exposure or who are COVID recovered. PIN 2112 also talks about the benefits of cohorting, which I guess supports the necessity for them to send out this PIN. They talk about the benefits being that this really does decrease the opportunities for exposure and transmission of the virus, as opposed to designating statuses of individual resident rooms that might be mixed together. Um, it facilitates a more efficient way to contact uh, trace in the event of a positive case because you're keeping uh, people separate and separate sections and sealed off parts of your facility. And it certainly allows for more targeted testing and quarantining and isolation of individuals if there's an exposure in that particular cohort. This pin also talks about the importance of reducing unnecessary hospital transfers. And it, it appeals to RCFEs and other assisted living providers um, that when caring for residents in the red or yellow cohorts, uh, if they are experiencing some higher level of care needs, that you really should consult with the, the, their primary care physician before calling for transport to the acute hospital, especially during a surge, because as we know, a lot of your residents really were not attended to timely during the surge. Um, they waited long periods of time in the emergency room. They, they probably didn't get more care and attention that you could have provided to them had you taken them and cared for them within your facility. So, so this, this, this part of the pin really highlights the importance of, of trying to care for your own and, and certainly making sure that you know the wishes of your residents, what their advanced care planning wishes are, what their post form says, so that you can adhere to their wishes and their wishes might be that they don't want to be transported to the hospital. It also talks about if you have to use oxygen for these residents in order to care for them within your facility, that you should do so. You should uh, work with your primary care physician. You should make sure that you have the right clinical competence to both administer and monitor um, the oxygen use. Um, so uh, this, this section of the pin is trying to address um, what was perceived to be in, in, in California, a large number of our uh, assisted living residents transferred to the acute setting unnecessarily. So PIN 2112 also really specifically covers uh, consistent staffing and PPE, and it provides um, a really excellent uh, handy chart that I'm going to turn to right now and, and share with you. Um, let's see. 
if I can find it. Um, hmm. Well, I'll share it at the end. How's that? You can see my slides again, right, um, Nicole? Can you all see my slides? Yes, again? sorry, we can. Okay, great. So I'll just continue on. I'll do that at the end. But, I, but it's really important. I really want all of you who are governed by CDSS as a regulator to print out pin 2112 uh, because it has this really handy uh, three page chart uh, that clearly shows um, what PPE to use, what staffing to use for each designated cohort. Um, so certainly keep in mind, and as this pin highlights for you, that you really want only specific certain staff to work within each cohort, uh, definitely within the red zone. And for those staff that are working in your red cohort, you should be offering them higher hazard pay, higher daily rate, uh, a daily rate in order to compensate them for, them, for the hazards that they're facing. Um, certainly, the, the red area should be as separate as possible, um, a, a, a separate floor, a, a separate wing, a, a dead end of a hallway, something like that. Um, the, the, the staff working in that red area need to have their own break room, They're, they need to have their node uh, in entrance and exit. And they really shouldn't be moving ever between the cohorts. They should never move from red to yellow or from yellow to green if they can avoid it. Uh, they have to wear the right PPE in both the red and the yellow cohorts, transmission-based precautions. Um, and we certainly want consistent assignment in all three of those designated areas. Um, if you have staff shortages and people do have to work uh, across the cohorts, try to always, of course, uh, work from uh, the green and ending with the red um, so that you're not moving from red to green. And uh, certainly, uh, the, the, I again, print out this pin because it has a, a, just a, a rich a uh, number of uh, really good information for you and your staff to determine how to, which PPE is appropriate to use for it, we, each individual cohort. PIN 2112 also addresses staffing shortages. And again, as a result of some of the experiences that RCFE's had over the last few months, uh, it put out here the necessity for leaders of assisted living providers to make sure that they have a plan on how to deal with staffing shortages, that they um, are taking a healthy look back and examining what might have gone wrong or astray uh, during an outbreak that might have led to staff shortages and how they can prepare better for the future. Uh, perhaps by having a, a, a working contract with a temporary staffing agency, uh, by hiring more on-call staff, uh, by having more meetings and communications with staff prior to an outbreak um, so that they have a clear understanding of testing and isolation and quarantine and PPE and the amount of PPE you have on hand. Um, clearly, we've learned that leaders that communicated regularly with their staff throughout the pandemic were less likely to face staffing shortages when an outbreak occurred. And so this pin is really directly addressing the need for leaders to have an emergency staffing plan. And finally, pin 2112 addresses N95 respirators talks about the necessity that they must be worn when staff are caring for residents in the red area. They must be worn when caring for residents in the yellow zone. You must have a respiratory protection program in place that's approved. Um, if, it, if you're under a tremendous uh, time crunch um, and 
due to your outbreak and you haven't had this in place, um, please make sure that you review uh, downloadable videos on how to seal an N95 respirator um, and that you're taking uh, measured steps on ensuring that the respirators are fitting your staff appropriately. But please, if you have some downtime within uh, this outbreak and you're in a period, a lull, if you will, uh, make sure you're taking the steps to uh, have a full respiratory protection program in place and you keep it in place so that you're ready as we go forward um, in any other pandemics that we might face in the future. And finally, face coverings are required um, and PIN 2112 just emphasizes the need that in all assisted living providers, surgical masks are required even if your uh, whole building is green. Um, face coverings are used for source control. They're really not considered PPE. Uh, the mandated face covering is in addition to safe distancing, high hand washing, and other infection control measures. Um, yes, we're all thrilled that our vaccination rates are pretty high. The number of doses going into resident staff arms are, are increasing every day, but we still have to follow these critical infection control standards in order to keep everybody safe. I want to come back to uh, a specific part of PIN 2109 uh, that spoke to um, these uh, additional regulations impacting assisted living and RCFE providers. And specifically, what, what they're talking about is this um, increased, re perceived increased requirement around testing. And what it says is that for um, RCFEs and other assisted living providers, um, if, if you have an outbreak um, or if you have a 30 day period in which you have 20 or more positive cases. So, so think about that, that you're, you know, you're probably constantly testing and, and you found 20 positive cases within a 30 day period. Um, it basically indicates that you have to test twice a week um, uh, until you, you have a two week period in which there are no new cases. Now, this is really no different than what Alameda County Public Health Department would be requiring of you and coaching you on in our work with you during your outbreak. Um, we've always, uh, basically required that you test all the residents and staff every three to seven days until you do not detect another positive case. Ideally, you're testing twice a week or every three to four days. Um, and that's always been the guidance. So um, if this is brought to your attention um, here and you, you, you're running a facility here in Alameda County, um, I don't think you need to change anything. I, I think that our our guidance is, is, is congruent with the change that you see here. I wanted to also highlight pin 2111 for you, which was around testing. And once again, this, this pin basically says that although we're in the process of vaccinating, you're still required to test and you're still required to test according to the strictest requirement by either the state or the county. So, this pin really is promoting the use of the new huge Valencia branch laboratory, the new state lab, and it's encouraging you to consider um, working with this lab um, and having them uh, take care of your testing needs over the next uh, three to four months. Um, so please consider uh, downloading this pin and clicking on the links so that you can uh, start working with the state Valencia lab. Oh yeah, here I gave you the link uh, in the slides and uh, Nicole will send out the uh, slide deck at the conclusion of our presentation today. What's nice is it's free 
and uh, free is better than cost. So please note that last bullet um, and, and consider how important it is that you continue to test your residents and staff as we move forward and hopefully out of this pandemic. So that kind of concludes my highlights of all the new guidance and information that's come out in the pins. I wanted to turn our attention now to giving you information related to what happens after the CDC Federal Pharmacy Partnership Program ends and, and what happens, how will you get your residents and staff vaccinated uh, after the third clinic is over because you will have new admissions, you will have readmissions, you'll have new hires of staff, uh, and you might, of course, have staff and residents who refused before and they're ready now. So the question is, how will you get, get everybody vaccinated after the third clinic? So, so here's the deal. So the federal government just recently last week um, signed a contract with over 6,500 retail pharmacies, including Pharmerica and Omnicare, and they are uh, allocating doses to these 6,500 retail pharmacies. And for the most part, most of your organizations are served by these retail pharmacies. So moving forward after your third clinic is over, if you were to have a new resident who needed a second dose uh, and they needed it in two weeks, uh, you would call your local pharmacy that you usually call to order medications for your residents and ask them to please uh, plan to administer that second dose or deliver that dose to you and you'll administer it if you have the staff competence to do so. Uh, for that resident. So basically, that's generally how it, how it will work, that, uh, that your local pharmacy will serve you from here on out. Now, here's some more details. Um, you should always request that acute hospitals or skilled nursing facilities vaccinate residents before they discharge them to a lower level of care like a RCFE or an assisted living provider. Uh, whether it be the first or second dose doesn't matter. You should be requesting that acute care hospitals and nursing homes vaccinate before discharge to a lower level of care or your facility. In addition, you'll work with your contracted pharmacies uh, who will store the vaccine. They can administer the vaccine after you order it for a resident. Um, you might have the opportunity to be registered in CalVax. And if you are, then the, your contracted pharmacy can simply reallocate doses to you and you can hold the vaccine in your facility and admit it, administer it to residents and staff as needed. Um, However, not all RCFEs have all the organizational characteristics to be approved in CalVax. Um, so for most of you, um, your local pharmacy will deliver and administer. Alternatively, family members of your residents could transport a resident to Kaiser Permanente to be vaccinated or in Alameda County pod to be vaccinated. Um, your staff may have to transport a resident to a Alameda County vaccination pod to be vaccinated or to Kaiser. So there are a number of ways um, for your residents to be vaccinated. And then for your staff, of course, your staff can go to any of the pods right now and make appointments. They can go to the Coliseum. So, for them moving forward, uh, they'll get vaccinated in the community or by their healthcare provider like Kaiser or Sutter. There's an informational call tomorrow that CDSS is hope hosting. It's called Preventing COVID-19 Next Steps After Vaccination. So I hope that you all tune in to the CDSS sponsored informational call tomorrow afternoon. 
and you can find the link on this slide here or by downloading pin 21-8, which is the uh, information about the uh, CDSS call. Well, great. My mouth is, is kind of dry. I feel like I've been doing a lot of talking, but I had a lot of information to share. Is there any questions in the chat box? Thank you, David. We appreciate it. Uh, we definitely have some questions here today. Uh, so uh, does a new resident um, need a COVID test if they have been vaccinated or your facility completed the vaccine clinic? So new resident coming in, we know they had their vaccine from their provider. Do we still ask for a, uh, a, a COVID vaccine test before they move in? Uh, no, no, you wouldn't need to. Um, you know, generally speaking, you should be treating all new admissions um, as a, a, a person under suspicion and you'd be wanting to quarantine them. Um, their vaccination status really doesn't change that um, because even if someone's vaccinated, we don't know if they could still be an asymptomatic virus carrier and be spreading the virus even though they're perfectly fine and safe from being hospitalized. So um, there is no change um, in how you should be handling new admissions uh, related to their vaccination status. Okay, so let's still follow that get the testing, go for it, just handle it as you would normally. But great to record that they have had their vaccine. Yes. So, you know, sometimes residents can be wily. So we have a situation here where resident got their first dose in the first clinic. Second clinic came around and they just weren't feeling it. And so they refused on the second clinic. And now they have the third clinic arriving shortly. Can that resident still receive the vaccine even that it's been more than 28 days. Oh, yes, yes. The CDC and I think the vaccine providers have both indicated that there's efficacy in vaccinating, giving someone their second dose um, uh, uh, well beyond the 21 or 28 days recommended. So yes, indeed, proceed. Uh, people should proceed with the second dose. Okay. And we have a facility here that their, their pharmacy they're working with is saying them, absolutely not. We will not give the first dose at the third clinic. So in that scenario, should they go ahead and use the pods that you described? Well, I think in that scenario that you should um, be in touch with me so I can be in touch with CVS or Walgreens and we can work this out because that's just not acceptable. It's better to at least get halfway there with the clinics and then just have to follow up afterwards. Yeah, um, sure. So can we get Renee or someone else to drop the email address where they can reach out to you or your team so they can get that assistance? Yes, yes, that's right here. Oops. Want to remind everyone, there's a lot of pins this last week. So if you have questions, this is a great time to get David's impression of those. Let's not pass this up. Uh, go ahead and drop your questions in the chat or in the Q&A because um, we still have some time left that we definitely want to make good use of. Yeah, we're hearing a couple people saying that the pharmacy partnership, they were told, nope, sorry, no first, uh, first shots on the third clinic. So I think a lot of people are having questions about that. So uh, David's team is going to drop the email in the chat. Be sure to grab that so you can reach out to them directly to have them work with the pharmacy partnership on that for you. Okay. And I am just going to stop sharing temporarily and track down that pin so I can pull that up. So just want to circle back to our earlier question that a new resident should still quarantine regardless of their vaccination status. I think you mentioned, you know, they still could be an asymptomatic carrier. So you would still suggest and recommend that new residents coming in take that time to quarantine as we have been doing. Yes, I would. Yeah, uh, we have to be very careful not to um, jump ahead with our own guidance related to the vaccine. 
you know, really so far, the only change in guidance related to the vaccine came out from the CDC last week, mm -hmm. where they said that, um, you know, essential workers who um, are two weeks post their second dose don't have to quarantine if they're exposed. Um, and that's the only change so far. So more will come. I think we just have to be patient. Um, definitely more guidance will come in, in, in the context of, of vaccines, um, but nothing yet. So just got to be patient there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think to be clear, like we're still, you know, even once you have completed your clinics, you should still be doing daily health attestations for your staff and you should still be asking for visitors like this isn't exactly this isn't going back to last February yet we're not we're not there it's simply an additional tool in our tool belt to help fight this disease that's right that's right and you still have to be vigilant with screening people at the door uh, screening people throughout their shift um, yeah you know it's it's really, we have positive developments, but it's just not quite over yet. And remember, even with with someone being vaccinated, there's still a 5% chance that they could get severe disease and end up in the hospital if they're positive. And we still, as I said, we don't know if they could be an asymptomatic carrier. Um, there's high suspicion that they won't be, and that will be wonderful news when the science proves that to be correct, um, but nothing yet. So please don't jump ahead of the guidance. Um, it, it will come, I, I promise you, it definitely will come, yeah. So what happens if a resident does go to hospital for maybe COVID or unrelated, maybe it's unrelated, maybe they fall, maybe something happens. Before returning to the home, uh, should they still be required to have a COVID-19 test? Um, no, generally speaking, um, if the hospital, um, you know, it, you can always ask for anything, right? But don't make it a condition on accepting the resident back. Right. When you check into a hotel, you should always ask for an upgrade. All they can say is politely no, right? Um, same thing with a, a resident here. Yeah, gently ask that they be tested. But even if they were tested, it doesn't change your protocols on admission. So it's not really, it's nice to know but your admission is still a person under suspicion. There's still yellow zone, still PPE. Um, and the CDC recommends a time-based strategy to uh, ensure the resident wasn't infected at the hospital. They don't allow for a test-based strategy. A test-based strategy would be, oh, you know, they tested negative two days ago at the hospital, they can come into our green zone. No, it, it, it just doesn't work that way. They, they're, they're in the yellow zone and, 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 and that's really where new admissions go. And so then again, reminder, sort of new residents. So we should still treat new residents entering an RCFB. Um, should they still go into a quarantine? Of course, we're having them tested, but still have them quarantined for a period of time? It depends on where they came from. You know, I think in all these cases, um, you know, everything is with an asterisk because you're, you, you have a, a lot of, you know, information to gather, like, you know, where did they come from? Who did they live with? Did those people go out working? Um, did they have their own room there, their own, you know, so it's a lot. And the, and the same with hold true related to if a resident just went to the emergency room for eight hours. I, I think it's worthwhile to be inquisitive about well, you know, was the emergency room really busy? You know, did they have a lot of COVID admissions there? You know, um, um, you know, and, and, and let that determine whether or not they may have been exposed there or not. 
Um, for the most part, the guidance says if the hospital is not in an outbreak, then you don't have to treat the resident who went there as being exposed. Mm -hmm. um, but for most of us, I think there's just a lot of chance of exposure during the transfer, during, you know, the, it, you know, just a, it, there's a lot of chances for it. So, um, you know, you, 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 being cautious around, you know, where they went, you know, who they interacted with and making decisions around that, along with the primary care physician and others who, who, who know the resident is, is the best approach. Yeah, and so I think you're saying, look, there's a difference between a hospital admission and an ER visit, but be discerning. Like there's no problem in saying, hey, can you do a test for us, but not preventing that resident from returning. You know, you can get the results the next day or, or whatever. Also mm -hmm. remembering that, you know, a point in time test is just that. So if a resident were to have been exposed on a short ER visit, likely that test they're gonna take on that day probably isn't going to reveal that. So just always be vigilant. You know, this is why you talked about early on is obtaining a CLIA waiver uh, that to make it so that, that facilities could do frequent testing. This is where that comes in handy. It's not, we're not past the, the crisis here, guys. This is where those CLIA waivers, and those other tools are so useful to you as an RCFE so that you can be responsive to that. Also Thanks. remember, the county has lots of testing sites that you can take residents to, or you can, you know, there's lots of options to obtain uh, information. Yes, yes, so true. And, um, and you want to take advantage of what you've learned throughout the pandemic. And one of the lessons learned, like Nicole just highlighted, was I wish I had had a CLIA waiver, right? So if you don't have a CLIA waiver yet, still pursue it because that's something you're gonna need in the future so that you can have those rapid point of care antigen test kits and have them on site and you're ready to go next time you have an outbreak. Um, if you can't get through CalVax and get your, your site registered on CalVax, take mm -hmm. care of some of the things that might be required so that you can be a registered provider to receive the vaccine which will um, enable you to vaccinate your residents and staff much easier next year because uh, we will have to vaccinate every single year. So you might as well be a CalVax approved provider and make it easy on yourself and your residents. Um, so definitely take some of these steps, um, remain vigilant, um, you know, uh, be, be wary of residents who go out, we still have, you know, pretty high community transmission, um, especially if you compare it to um, months ago. So we, we still want to be aware that while our residents and staff might be protected, many others aren't in Alameda County. David, you must have just read the, the participants' mind because their questions have now transitioned to around visits, as well as sort of residents leaving the building. Uh -huh. So if a resident's been vaccinated, and remember everyone, you don't reach full efficacy until about two weeks after your second dose, can that resident go out and visit their family, maybe go to a family gathering at someone's home? Uh, are there any restrictions on the resident's movement at this point as it pertains to vaccination? Uh, well, well, yeah, I mean, we're still in the purple tier. Um, it wouldn't be really wise for um, individual families to be taking loved ones out at this time. Um, um, a, a, again, we, we just want to be patient, wait for some additional guidance to come out. I think a lot of visitors will also be receiving the second dose soon. And, you know, so I think we can certainly expect that vaccination rates and vaccination status will play a big role in, in guidance in the very near future. Um, so, but all you can do uh, to prepare for that right now is have a very high percentage of residents and staff who took the vaccine so that you can get in the game when, when the game begins because it will be based on percentages. I guarantee it, uh, just like we base testing on 10% positivity rates, et cetera. Um, so, 
certainly um, make sure, but it but it it really hasn't changed as of yet. I, I'm looking at some of the questions now. Um, so can you remind us about the visitation policy when we're in the purple tier? Sure, Because sure. I want to be clear with folks, the visitation poly policy, it has nothing to do with your vaccination rate. It's just, this is the policy based on where, what tier you're at right now. So can you remind us of those requirements? Yeah, yeah. But hopefully that will be the, like one of the next pins that comes out will be changes in visitation around within the context of vaccines. I'm sure it will. Um, but right now, if you don't have any positive cases, if you're not doing response testing, then you should be accommodating the safest type of visitation, which is outdoor visitation. But also while we're in the purple tier, if you're not in outbreak mode and not doing response testing, you can accommodate indoor communal space visitation in a large dining room or a large foyer or a large community space with proper distancing, no, no touching, uh, PPE. Um, and, um, but if you were in an outbreak and doing response testing, you couldn't do communal space visitation. You could, but you could still do outdoor visitation. Um, now, once we move to the next tier, you know, red, yellow, or I, I can't remember, orange, red, yellow, or orange, um, then you can accommodate indoor in-room visitation if you're not in an outbreak. So remember, the safest visitation is outdoor visitation. Uh, the next level of risk is indoor communal space. And then the riskiest would be indoor in room um, or indoor in a small, you know, apartment. Um, and that could only be done if you have no outbreak and we're in those lower tiers. Any one of the lower tiers, you, you could then accommodate that. Appreciate that. So um, I think this is our last question and it's one we get every week. So I really want um, to get this out, which is, you know, how can people get information related to Alameda County public health and long-term care facilities? Is there a listserv they should be on? Is there a direct link they can go to the website? Because it's, it's getting a little challenging to, to navigate to that. So how can they be sure to get the up to the minute information as it relates to Alameda County public health and long-term care facilities. Yeah, yeah, we're building our own page on our website. Um, so it's gonna be much easier for you. Um, and um, that's in process, should be done pretty soon though. So we recognize the hard navigation that we had and we're in the process of fixing that. But we don't really have a list serve, um, but certainly we wanna keep the this venue open for you um, and keep bringing you information till we feel like, you know, there's nothing else to bring. Um, so we, we wanna keep this venue with you um, and uh, keep bringing you up to date. Um, but, um, yeah, those, those are my, my updates related to how to stay connected. And then, of course, we're always just here to serve you. So, you know, you, you, you have our contact information and, and you should feel free to be in touch with us if you have any com, uh, questions or concerns. Okay. Well, David, do you have any last minute thoughts for us before we head out for one more next week as we fight this disease? No, no, just to keep saying that, um, you know, in this pandemic, your leadership matters, you matter a, a lot. And, um, and for the most part, I bet if you're as committed to joining this webinar on a Tuesday afternoon at the holiday, you're probably a pretty committed leader. So my hat's off to you. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for your efforts to keep learning and staying on top of stuff so that you can fulfill that really important leadership role that you that you have. So thank you. 
Uh, well, thank you everyone. As a reminder, we will send you the recording and the PowerPoint and any additional information uh, by tomorrow. And we look forward to seeing you back here with us next Monday. So have a great week. Thank you.